In today's video, I'm gonna show you how to set up and manage a construction portfolio schedule. A portfolio schedule helps you align all of your projects. That way you can extract milestones, optimize resources, or automate your reporting. Now, this can come in handy whether you're working on three projects or 3,000. I've set up countless portfolio schedules across billions of dollars of projects globally, and I've distilled it down to six key steps. We're gonna walk through these steps one by one in this video. This approach works whether your projects are tightly integrated or if they're completely independent. The six steps we are gonna cover are portfolio system design, standardization, database mapping, creating reports, aligning people and projects, and maintaining the system. Let's get started. Our book, The Critical Path Career, How to Advance in Construction and Planning and Scheduling is out now and you can order it on Amazon. We'll include a link below. This is a great way to show support for the Beyond Deadlines podcast. And Greg and I have worked extremely hard taking everything we know in our 30 years of experience, plus everything we've picked up from shooting this podcast, and we've tried to pack it into an information dense book that you can use right away. In the book, we have specific strategies on how to get a raise, how to get a promotion, and find a new job. We include 26 of the best interview questions that we have come across, in addition to 34 specific impact ideas that you can go use on your projects today. We want to thank everyone who's shown us support so far and enjoy this week's episode. Think of portfolio scheduling as a system. Any system will have inputs, a process and then create outputs. Before I run off and start coding schedules and try to think about reports, I like to sit down and think about how is this system going to work? And typically the best place to start is the outputs. So what I mean by outputs is, What's that final report you're going for? What are the outcomes are you trying to drive out? Do you need milestone variants? Are you going after benchmarking? And you can take that even a step deeper and try and think about what the people who are going to use the portfolio system would like to see out of it. Do they wanna see a PowerPoint presentation, a dashboard, or a document or report? By starting with the outputs and working backwards, this is gonna save you countless hours as you start to get in to build your system because you'll have an end goal in mind you'll be able to make decisions about the system that will directly impact how you're going to build it. Now, I've included quite a few goodies in this video and one of them is a guide that will help you do just that. Let's just browse it right now and you'll be able to find the link below. Here is the portfolio planning worksheet that I created. This is gonna walk you through each step of this video, but you're gonna do it ahead of time to help better plan out your portfolio system. So just as I was explaining in the video, if we look down here, it will start with what are you gonna define as your output? There are examples here that will help you walk through step-by-step step what you want your portfolio system to look like. As we jump down into step two, we start to look at who our audience is. So what we're looking for here is who's gonna be using it. A very critical step as you start to think about how you wanna build your portfolio system. So now I'll give you a quick flyby of the rest of the guide because we're gonna talk through this step-by-step step in the video. But this guide hits on standardized milestones, it's gonna walk us through standard activity codes and project codes. We'll look at how you define your tech stack of where you're getting your data from all the way through where you're reporting it out of. And it even has a calendar for update cadence so you get everything aligned to the same system. And finally, how you're gonna maintain that system. Now, what I want you to do is to go through, download a copy of the guide and walk through it step-by-step step as best you can to start working through how you're gonna build your portfolio system. Again, I can't stress this enough. This is gonna save you a ton of time on the back end and will help you think through some of the challenges that are gonna come up ahead of time. Now, let's jump into standardization. Standardization is one of the most important things when it comes to portfolio scheduling. It's what allows you to be able to pull from each different project schedule, but pull the same information and keeps the system moving smoothly. We're going to walk through a very simplistic example of just standardizing a couple high level milestones for portfolio reporting. But this will give you an insight into how you start connecting these different project schedules. All right, let's pull open an example of a major milestone sheet and I can walk you through this. What you'll notice here is I have a column for activity ID. This activity ID will be the exact activity ID that's in Primavera P6 on all of the projects. Then you have a milestone name and a milestone definition. 
The milestone definition is extremely helpful if people are looking to what they should tie in as predecessors and successors. And I've seen these sheets even list out standard predecessors and successors. Here's a pro tip if we're working with activity IDs. Don't number them sequentially, one, two, three, four. If you look at my sheet, if I wanted to add a milestone between site acquisition and master planning, and site acquisition was number one, master planning was number two, what are we gonna do? Name it 1.5? Put a couple digits in between each of your milestones and that'll give you a ton of flexibility. Once you have a standard set of milestones, the next place we're gonna look to standardize is activity codes and project codes. Let's dive back into the guide and I'll explain this one to you. All right, after we standardize milestones, we need to start looking at project level codes and activity level codes. I'll show you these specifically in P6 in a second, but check out this section of the guide, which will help kind of walk us through why this is important. See, these codes help extract the data, but they also help us filter and sort, which is a key component to portfolio reporting. If you look at the example here, we have project codes that are region, so maybe you're working across a west and east and a central region, or what sort of phase the project could be in. So maybe the project is only starting design or it's in construction. This is just a quick code that will allow you, let's say you had a thousand projects, you could see the 300 that are only in the design phase. The next are activity specific codes. These are the ones that are applied right to the activity. Now these get it even a little bit more detail. So maybe in the construction phase, you wanted to see different sorts of trades. Well, you could go apply those codes and then pull them out through that data out through your portfolio report. The next one is maybe you want to see the data done by contractor. So that way you could apply the contractor code across your different activities in your schedule and then extract that data out. Let's dive into Primavera P6 and see how all of this standardization works in the schedule. All right, folks, let's dive into Primavera P6 and see how some of this standardization plays out into the system. What you'll notice here, a couple of those standard milestones I have that are spread across three example projects that I created. If we click on one of these, like start project, you'll see that I have a activity code that's labeled major milestones. In the next step, it's gonna talk about extracting data out of Primavera P6. What this allows people to do is say, every single start project, as you'll see, is labeled MS0010, has the same name as start project, and down here has a major milestone activity code. So if you were gonna go pull all this data in the system, if you kind of think about this, it's in a spreadsheet now. That's essentially how the back end of Primavera P6 works. You can very quickly identify start project, the major milestone code, and the activity ID. Gives you a lot of flexibility there. Let's go ahead and look at some of the project and how the project codes are set up. All right, folks, here's the project view on Primavera P6. And if I just select any one of these projects, what you're gonna see is a whole horde of codes down here that would allow me to filter and sort and provide that really juicy data that our project would need. I'm pretty sure these are just the standard codes that come in with Primavera P6. But as you'll see, there's some really good ideas of what you can apply uh, to your portfolio project. For example, there's a risk rating, you have financial rating, uh, project type, strategic objective, location. That's where if you go back and you look at our worksheet and you start to define what you want your outputs to be, it's so important because as you go through and think about what you wanna standardize, that will help guide you to what codes you're gonna need to put in the system which will allow you to help pull this data out. Let's move along to step three, where we can start mapping out our databases. If we have standardized data and standardized projects, we can start thinking about how we're gonna extract that information out of P6. You totally can pull all of this information from P6, but what can happen as you start to get from 10, 20 to 100 to maybe even 1,000 projects it will become a very challenging process to open up all the project files or export all the project files. And that's where you're gonna start shifting to taking the data from Primavera P6 and extracting it through some sort of database. Now, I'm not gonna deep dive into how to do that. There are plenty of videos on it. I'll link one below by Juliana Smith that is absolutely amazing on how to do that. But what I do wanna talk about are some of the tactics that people forget 
when they go through that process. So you gotta remember, Primavera P6 on the back end is just a series of spreadsheets and project tables. You know, I think there are hundreds of them. If I remember correctly, there's really only five to 10 that actually matter. But what consistently happens is when people start to extract that data out of Primavera P6, they start to name it funny things. I don't know why this is. But for example, maybe they'll name start, the start date from Primavera P6, they'll name it to early start. This constantly happens and it's a challenge if it gets mislabeled. So what you want to do is first map out where your data is going to go. It's going to start from Primavera P6. It's probably going to go to a database and then there's going to be an output to it. That could potentially be Power BI or something like that. Once you've created that overarching system map, it's then important to think about what is your detailed Rosetta Stone going to look like. Work with whoever is setting it up or yourself if it's you and create that Rosetta Stone that explains the different mappings from Primavera P6 front end to the database that you're working with. So that way start date matches start date. This will save you a ton of headaches later, and then you'll be able to, when you get into your reporting tool, be able to quickly create reports without having to figure out what the data means or what this field is. If going out there and mapping all the databases and then trying to recreate all your reports in Power BI seems too crazy for you, there's other solutions that exist. One of them that I like is nodes and links. You can quickly create a portfolio schedule by simply uploading your schedule to the software. Here on the screen, I have those three example schedules. This took me maybe five minutes to set up. And as you can see, I have a nice timeline and I can dive into this data and check it out. Similar to any other report, except nodes and links is a specialized scheduling tool. So that way it's gonna give me specialized scheduling data that will far surpass anything you could ever build in Power BI. If you look here at their trends page, you can see that I can quickly look at the progress, milestones delayed, the overall delay, a delay trend, and a health score. Everything here is completely modifiable. And if you'll notice why there's lots of zeros is because I uploaded fake schedules without anything in them. So if you're a little overwhelmed or think Power BI is an overcomplicated solution, check out nodes and links and see if maybe that's a solution for your program. Let's move on to step four, which is creating the report. Now I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that there's one report that rules them all, one metric that rules them all, or one thing you absolutely need to do. Depending on your industry and your project and your portfolio, there is a wide range of different reports that you can create that will be high value and high impact. But what I can tell you are three lessons from creating thousands of reports from across my career. The first one, less is more. Every single report or dashboard should probably only have one to two pieces of data. Anything more will completely overwhelm your audience. You don't need the spaceship control panel with 47 different widgets on it because it will be too confusing. So focus on one to two pieces of critical data. The second one is you have to have a frame of reference for your audience if you're gonna share data. So that frame of reference must include a baseline or a contract date. What date is the project supposed to hit? What is the current forecast? And then lastly, what is the trend to that? If you're showing a negative 37 day variance for this update period, is that good? Is that bad? No one knows without a trend. Maybe it used to be negative 100 and you've just gotten 70 days back. Maybe it's been zero and you lost 30. Without that trend information, the data doesn't tell the story. So always, always, always include those three points. Lastly, you're gonna need to be able to tell the story. Data is just one piece of the puzzle. And in those last examples I mentioned, you can tell that even if you just put that data up, it's not gonna tell the story. So leave room in your report to be able to convey to your audience what is going on through the portfolio data that you're pulling up. When you add that commentary, to make sure that there are components of it that are actionable. What should people be doing now that they've read your reports? Let's move on to section five, aligning people and projects. Let's say you've created this beautiful report. To get that thing out there and make sure it works, you're gonna have to align everybody on what it says, how it works, and what you need from people to make sure this thing can happen. To do this, you might have to do a variety of things. You're probably going to have to teach people about the new milestones and the new processes and the new inputs you're going to need from them. You'll probably need to go do a road show to go out to people to sit with them either virtually or face to face and explain 
what it is you're doing, why it's good for them and how it helps them. And lastly, if you're working with contractors, you may even need to update contractual specifications. That way these changes you wanna make are contractually obligated and people will be required to follow them. If you have to go change a contract, just make sure you try and do it with a no cost change order. As long as you're not asking to completely reinvent the wheel and make thousands of changes, most contractors will go out and do that free of charge. If you're facing a ton of resistance, simply start with the new and upcoming projects. You can insert all your changes and everything that's new on your requirement side and people will just take it and run with it and not know the difference. Now let's talk about cadence. A portfolio system is only as good as the data being fed to update it. If you have projects that are sending up updates at all sorts of times across the month, it's going to be complete chaos and it is not gonna be an efficient system. I'm gonna share with you a calendar that I use to set up at Google to manage over $10 billion in capital construction. And I'll show you how it works. Let's dive into this calendar that I created. First thing you'll note here are a couple colorful dates. These are extremely important dates that I want people to grab their attention to quickly. The first one is a data date lock. So a team will have a full week to update their project's progress and put it in the system. And then we're gonna lock the data. The reason why we lock the data on their end, and this would be for an example, if you are pulling project data from Primavera P6 and putting it into a database, you essentially work with your team to figure out how you can lock that data is because we're going to then need to report off of that information. And if you're constantly changing the data, it can't be reported off in an efficient manner. So then. At a big portfolio review, you'll have usually project level reviews than some higher level executive management review. So after that data locks, then the project teams are allowed to review that data, create their commentary, their feedback, get aligned on their reports, and then it will go to management for presentation. This cycle will repeat itself in the following month and you can create a full calendar out of every single month during the year so that way each team is dialed in on what they need to provide by when, when the data will lock, and when management presentations are. This really helps you build that cadence that you're looking for to get three to 3,000 projects all on the same page. Lastly, moving into number six, maintaining your scheduling system. All right, we've made it to the last step, maintaining your portfolio schedule system. Let's say you've nailed that road show, you've set up your portfolio reporting, you've gotten your cadence down, and things are starting to go along smoothly. The one thing you need to focus on though is how are you gonna maintain that system month in and month out. As you set up new projects, as old projects finish, you have to be able to make sure that the system will stay generating the data that you wanna see. The first step to maintaining your system is data integrity checks. You can set up reports that will highlight whether the milestones that needed to be there are there, whether the coding needs to be there or there. You can quickly look for null values and provide feedback to the team. And this can go across any sort of data or metric you wanna track, but having that reports set up that will show you where the issues are will help you go and diagnose it. The second one is maintaining a healthy cadence. If teams are getting information to you late or they're constantly having to change data after the lock date, that points to an issue. You can dive in and work with those teams and figure out what problems are they having that are keeping them from providing you the information that you need. And lastly, you wanna constantly be getting user feedback. You're trying to create a portfolio scheduling system that provides value and impacts and helps people out. You need to be talking with your project team on how you can improve the process. You need to be talking with your executive team to see if they're getting value out of the reports you're creating. You need to be seeing, is the information that I'm creating useful? Otherwise, it just creates bureaucratic churn. Always, always be looking for feedback, either through surveys, one-on-one, -on -one, or any other way you can think of. All right, folks, those are the six steps I use to set up portfolio schedules. I hope you've liked and enjoyed this video today. Feel free to drop a like or subscribe to the channel. We are going to be releasing a ton of content that's gonna dive into the tactics and strategies to help improve construction scheduling. We'll see you on the next one.